Please be seated. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to all. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be here again, able to gather. Uh, perhaps you're a visitor this morning or uh, perhaps you're a guest of someone and uh, we want you to know that we're honored uh, to have you with us here today. Um, today, we'll be participating in uh, communion or the Lord's Supper, you see that prepared up here. And we want you to know that if you are a professing follower of uh, Jesus, uh, no matter how you uh, meet with others, where you meet, or what your tradition is, you're welcome to participate with us today. If you're not sure you're a Christian, or you're not sure what this means, we would suggest that you not participate. But if you'd like to know more about uh, what it means to be a Christian or uh, you have any questions about this experience today, we would, uh, we would love you to ask someone and there will also be folks up here in front available for prayer after the service. Um, anything else that uh, takes place uh, in today's service, we would uh, welcome you, uh, whether you're a part of our fellowship or not, to participate with us today in anything. Uh, and so, uh, Joe, if you could come up. Joe's got a, a ministry moment for us. A ministry moment insofar as hot dogs can be considered a ministry. Um, <laughs> so you may have noticed that we've been serving hot dogs after the service for the last several weeks. Uh, this is something that was actually started by a gentleman named Ken Pendleton, who you may recall who worshiped here quite a while ago, him and his family. Um, and in our Bible study, we were recollecting that and decided that we would do that this, uh, this, pa this past July. And it's been a great source of blessing to us to make hot dogs and to just see people slowing down a little bit, take a minute and to have some fellowship. And I've been seeing people shaking hands and introducing each other, and it's been awesome. However, 
Our Bible study camping trip is next week, and so we will not be here. So we're going to put, this is the last week we're going to be doing the hot dogs, and I wanted to let you know. So while you're enjoying a hot dog today, be thinking about next week, because at the end of the service, you're going to have this curious expectation of food right after the service that you might not be able to explain. So this week, when you're enjoying it and shaking hands and saying hello to people, make a lunch date for next week. Meet somebody you don't know. If you see somebody that's here in the sanctuary that's been coming for maybe a few months and you don't know them, introduce yourself. Invite them to lunch next week. The summer hours are a great time to do it. There's plenty of time to get to the house and to chat while you fix a light lunch. And so I just wanted to encourage you, don't, well, first off, don't be disappointed next week when the hot dogs aren't there, but make a plan. Make a plan to have fellowship with someone new next week. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So you were probably offered one of these uh, as you came in. And uh, in there, uh, you'll find uh, uh, what's planned for today. And you'll also find some more information about us, including how to find us on the web and on Facebook. So we encourage you to, to take this and, and use this. <clears throat> Personal security is much sought after these days. But where does real security come from? Today, David Smith will speak about a reality check that occurred in the experience of a certain rich man. Now, to all gathered here, I would invite those who are able to stand. From Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before God our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. When this nation back, change the
you that you're the shepherd who leads us um, and just just for just for what that means of we know where you're leading us to but even here now God um, just be guiding us to so that we can walk in the in the paths of your righteousness um, help us not to forget the that the the time we have here that the paths that we walk here are um, 
important and, and have a lasting effect on ourselves and others. We just thank you again that, that you do lead us, God, and we can trust you to do that. Amen. Please greet one another with the love of Christ. As we gather together, this is a house of prayer, and during the next part of our service, we'll have uh, various prayers. One is a pastoral prayer, and another is a unison prayer that's in your bulletin. Then we'll sing the Lord's Prayer, so we hope you can participate in all of those. And by the way, if you see someone who is falling asleep, rather than to be disturbed with them, just reach out and say thank you for helping out with Vacation Bible School this week. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Merciful Heavenly Father, who raised Jesus from death to life, we come before you as people whose motives are mixed and whose ways are inconsistent. Our spirits rejoice in your love, even as they are weighed down with regrets. We have lived by faith even as doubts play our minds. We have done good things, and we have done bad things. We want to be faithful, yet we resist your leading. We come as people who are in need of correction, of grace and cleansing. Forgive us for faithless, foolish, simple acts and attitudes. Forgive us, Father, for our arrogance and arrogance and grieving of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for grumbling against you and your body. Set us free again on a path that glorifies you in bringing truth and holiness for all people. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we As we now prepare to give to the Lord his tithes and offerings, 
And uh, as we take the offering, I invite you to remain seated and to sing this great hymn of the faith, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. It's found on 198 and will also be projected on the screen in front of you. Here, now from Ephesians 1, 7, and 8. The Bible says, In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. If we think about God's grace, let that motivate us in our giving today, giving to the Lord as a, uh, as a, a thanksgiving to him for his great grace given to us.
Scott, would you lift up a prayer as we dedicate this offering to the Lord? Grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, we plant these offerings into your kingdom like the farmer who sows the seed. We sow this into your kingdom that you, we pray for your Holy Spirit to multiply it, to share your good news here in Bolton and around the world. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated as the children are dismissed for kinder church. Good morning. The Old Testament reading today is found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. And I invite you to follow along in the Pew Bibles in front of you, if you'd like. Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers, as it is today. The New Testament reading is found in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 15 to 19. Philippians 4, 15 through 19. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Please stand for the reading of the gospel found in Luke 12, 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, and then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we begin this part of our service together. Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the inspiration of every word in the Bible, breathed out by your Holy Spirit through these different authors. We thank you, Father, for uh, 
this Gospel of Luke as we've been moving through week by week in this expositional series. And now as we come to this part of your word, we ask that you give us ears to hear and that we'd have willing spirits to, to heed it and that we would be uh, more committed followers of Jesus Christ as a result of it. So Lord, speak to us now as we dive into your word for today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Well, today as we look at our passage from Luke 12, 13, we have a very short story. It's called the parable of the rich fool. The rich fool. It's a message that's clear. It's a message that's very direct. It's a message that's very critical and important to all of us when it concerns one of the biggest snares in the lives of so many people is the snare of material possessions that can grab hold of us and, and to neglect the most important thing, our very souls, our very souls. Well, as we look at the passage before us, it's important to look at it in its proper context. If you look at a scripture and take it out of context, you can go in a very wrong direction. So we need to look at it in its context of, of when Jesus preached it and what was going on in the situation. Well, Jesus is preaching to a group of thousands of people. There's so many people that as we see it, it says that they were tripping over one another. What a wonderful problem to have. Something I can relate to this week with all the children running all over the place and sometimes you are tripping over children. What a great problem to have. Well, there they were, and Jesus gives this very strong message to the thousands of people that are gathering. And in the strong message, he warns them about hell. And he says, fear not the man that can destroy your body, but fear the one that can put you into hell. And as a result of this very strong message that Jesus gives, this man steps up and says, Jesus, could you settle an argument between me and my brother? Uh, there's an argument here about our inheritance, and, and I want to make sure I get my fair share. Can you imagine now, Jesus has warned a person about their eternal destiny, and the response to that is, you know, I want to have more money. It's like, okay, were you listening to anything that I've just shared with you? That's your response? So that's the context that we find. And he says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, Jesus' response to the man's complaint and plea for Jesus to be the arbit to arbitrate a settlement in this matter is immediate and it's clear. Look at verse 14. Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? And then he once again addressed the crowd with yet another warning and said, watch out, be on your guard for all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. So he sees in this man, he wasn't concerned about his, his soul. He wasn't getting the message because he was all consumed with greed. He wanted more money. And sometimes if that is controlling you, that's all you can think about. All you're thinking about all the time. And it can be a great snare to your soul. Life is so much more than the abundance of possessions. Is that true? Think about that now. Is life more than the abundance of possessions? Is that what it is that true? All right, look, a few more are with me. Some are still pondering that because you're you're thinking about, are you setting me up here or what? Well, some sometimes with a person that is suffering with greed. There's this gnawing appetite for more and more and more possessions, more and more wealth, more and more land. It's like, how much is enough? Just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And this is a, is a great concern, and Jesus addresses the crowd with a parable, with a short story, warning the people the dangers of a life of pursuing uh, material possessions and lavish living while impoverishing your very soul. 
Well, he tells a story. He said there once was this very rich man, a certain rich man, that, that his land produced a great crop. Well, rather than to say, thank you, God, for this great provision, he doesn't respond in that way. He doesn't respond like Deuteronomy 8 says, saying, God, you give me the power to accumulate this wealth. And I thank you for that. He doesn't do that. Instead, he says, okay, what am I going to do with all of this grain I have? I know what. I'll tear down the old barns. I'll build bigger ones so I can store up all of my, uh, my wealth. And I'll take life easy. I'll sit back. I'll eat. I'll drink. I'll be merry. And I'll just sort of live off the fat of the land. And, and so what happens? He does that. But then Jesus says, you fool, this very night your life will be required of you, then who will get what you have laid up for yourself? So the message is this, all of us will die one day. All of us will face the Lord Jesus Christ to give an account for our life. Will we be like the rich fool who lives for material possessions only? Or will we be a person who is rich towards God and rich towards others? So I want you to think about that question. At the end, will your life be the life that shows richness towards others and towards God and his kingdom? Or will your life show richness towards yourself? Richness towards yourself. Well, what does a life that's rich towards God look like? All right, let's get a, something that we can we can articulate here. I'd like to, to show four quick things. A life that's rich toward God hangs on to material things lightly. All right? Hangs on to material things lightly. Ready to share, to give away what God has blessed them with uh, to others. You may have worked hard for it. You may have earned it by the sweat of your brow. It's yours. You deserve it. But hang on to those things lightly. Be ready to share them with others in need. Give them away. This past week, I think of uh, all the money that was raised by the children for Robley Alto to build playgrounds for the children in that part of the world. And I know some of the children probably worked very hard for their nickels and dimes and quarters, that they did chores around the house. And yet they cheerfully said, here you go. This is for those other children I may never see in this life, but I care for them. They demonstrated a life that's rich towards God. A life that's rich toward God is generous in giving to others. When the barn is full, rather than saying, time to build another barn, it's saying, perhaps I need to get rid of some of those things that I have and to give it to someone else who is in need. That's the life of a person who's rich towards God. Secondly, a life that's rich towards God is a life which says, how can I bless others and take time and energy that God has given me to invest for the kingdom of God? This past week, we just had vacation Bible school. Over 100 volunteers that were demonstrating a life that's rich towards God. Cutting up cheese, being a nurse on call for, uh, for scraped knees on, on different activities, uh, people just being there to, to help in teaching classes, decorating rooms, cleaning up afterwards, breaking down the stage, running the vacuum. It's demonstrating a life that's rich towards God, sharing the love of Jesus with children and with their parents, not only making them smile, but making God smile. That's a life that's rich towards God, doing the drama, doing the, the music, all the things involved in that one outreach of this church, and so many other things that we can demonstrate life that is rich towards God. Thirdly, a life that's rich toward God is a, is a, is a life that gives financially, giving uh, dollars so we can give Bibles free, free, so we can offer vacation Bible school free of, of charge so that we can do the work that we do here and offer a ministry. That generosity in our giving is a life that's rich towards God. And fourthly, a life that's rich towards God is a life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, 
that looks outward to the needs of others instead of seeking first God's kingdom, instead of seeking first our own needs and wants, living a life of, of uh, eating and drinking and, and being... Uh, and uh, eating and drinking and being merry, trying to get those three words together there in my mind. All right. Well, the day, the day will come when each one of us will stand before God for judgment. And he will look at us and say, either rich fool, depart from me, I never knew you, or well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, you've been rich towards my kingdom, rich towards others. Come into heaven that's waiting for you. Come into that place of everlasting peace and reward for a life that's well lived. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider this parable of the rich fool, Lord, it's a great warning given to the people of that day, but it's a warning that we can all relate to today in our own lives. Show us, Lord, what it means to find our security in you. Help us to be rich towards you in the giving of our time, the giving of our talents, our energies, the giving of our finances, the giving of our prayers, sharing of the goods that you've given us with others in need. Show us what it looks like and grow us up to be a church of people that are rich towards you and rich towards others. Father, protect us from the snares of materialism, from the, the snares of a life of greed as we seek to provide for our households well. We thank you for that, uh, that call to do that. And if we don't care for our households well, we're worse than unbelievers. But Lord, in the course of doing that, very good thing. Show us, Lord, what it means to continue to be outward focused and caring for the needs of others. Help us not to be like the rich fool, that that very night his life was required of him and he went before you for judgment. The day is coming when we will experience that. May we be ready for that day. This is a turning point for some of us here today. We've been going a certain direction in our lives and finding our security in certain things. Show us what it looks like to have security in Christ, security in your kingdom, and live lives that are rich, rich towards you and towards others. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We now prepare for receiving communion together. I invite you to stand and sing verses 1 and 2 of Amazing Grace. It's found in 202 in your hymnals, or you may have it memorized. Let's stand together as we prepare for communion.
let us remain standing as we join together in affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed. It will be in your bulletin or also around the cross projected as well. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the conscious Pilate, was crucified and died in the Missouri. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life of the last Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to read two scriptures as we prepare to receive communion uh, together. The first is from Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Let that sink in a bit. When we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more will be saved from God's wrath through him? Through him, through Christ. To be saved from God's wrath through Jesus. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And then from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord also, I pass on to you the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. So as we receive together this bread and this cup, we proclaim Jesus died for us, the righteous one, for the ungodly one, to, show, to save us from God's wrath and to give us life everlasting and reconciliation with God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying for us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you that the righteous requirement of God was fulfilled, fully met in your substitutional atonement on the cross for our sins. Now as we take this bread, speak to us. Speak to us of your body that was nailed to the cross for our sins. As we take this cup, speak to us, Lord, of your precious blood that was poured out for the redemption and the cleansing of our sins so that we can be reconciled to God and have the security of everlasting life through faith in his finished work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. As our servers pass the bread, if you could just take a piece and hold it, and we'll, we will consume together as we uh, 
we establish, we affirm our faith in Christ. Go and serve. Let us drink together the cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood given for us. Mark, would you offer a prayer of thanksgiving for us? Just put your cups in there again. Amen. Let's stand as we conclude our service with verses 3, 4, and 5 of Amazing Grace. Just a few weeks, um, I think it's, uh, it's the 24th of August, a Sunday, we'll have a believer's baptism service right after church. And that'll be over at the Bolton Pond, and it'll be a public declaration of someone's faith in Christ. It'll be awesome. So please put that on your calendar for the 24th of August after church. So we'll go over there and we'll probably begin somewhere around 11.15. So bring a, a lunch along with you and enjoy some fellowship over there. Uh, but if you would like to be baptized as a believer, uh, the water is nice and warm over there, all right? And so 
I'm uh, happy to meet with you and talk with you and help you to prepare a testimony to share why you have decided to follow Christ. And uh, uh, the Bible says to believe in Jesus and be baptized. So I encourage you to not only put your trust in Christ, but to publicly declare that before uh, others as well. Receive now the benediction, and I hope you can stay for some hot dogs afterwards outside. Now may the grace of God, the love of the Lord Jesus, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all those whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.